It is so good to be back uh, in Garfield High School seeing faces, and I'm looking forward to seeing your face every week on, on Sunday morning. You know, since I was, I was born in the church, that's what I like to say, and every week, my family, we always went to church. It did not matter uh, what was going on. It was always important to be at church and to be in the house of the Lord, and, and uh, for us, it was because we needed to grow in the Lord, but also so that we can be in fellowship with the saints. We were created for relationships. Amen? We we're created for that. It's not good when in the Adam, when he was there and God looked, it's not good for man to be alone. It is not good for us to be uh, separated for too long. It's better for us to come in fellowship one with another. So, I want to dive right in and I want to finish up this series that we've been doing today on the parables of Jesus. And last week we started talking about the parable of the lost son. And I want to talk more about that parable this morning and finish that. And from there, moving forward, we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit after next week. Next week we have uh, Peter Margraf is going to be with us ministering, so I'm really excited about that. Be sure and be here you know, next Sunday. And um, this service, all our morning services are going to air at 7 p.m. online. You can watch it again if you want. You can take a look. Uh, we'll be uploading that and, and get that for you. So, so again, today I want to finish this series, but before we do, let, let's pray. Father, this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word never returns void. And I thank you that our hearts and our minds, Lord, would just be open to receive what you have. I come against all distractions right now and command them to go right now in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father, for a focus on you, on your spirit, Lord, that we may receive from you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I want to begin reading and I want to read where we went through last week on the parable of the lost son. So buckle in, we're going to read a lot of verses beginning Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 11. It says, And then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Mm. But when he came to himself, one of the most important parts of this story, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. Aren't you glad the father saw you and had compassion? Amen. And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. So the first confession, when he said, uh, I am no longer, uh, you know, worthy. I'll just be your servant, you know. This was his first confession. He came to himself. The son realized in this moment that the only thing, the only way that he could get life is from his father. There's no other way. There's no other way that we truly get life other than from the Father. That's the only way to get true. That's the only way to live, in my opinion. 
I look at so many different ones and, and, you know, my wife was up here earlier and she was talking about, you know, things that we go through and the heaviness and things like that. You know, I, don't, I see different ones and how they go through stuff. I don't know how they do it without God. I just don't know. Because every single time when something it faces me, my immediate response, sometimes I may flesh out a little bit, but it ain't long. I'm going to the Heavenly Father. I'm going to God. I might do the freak out, you know, on something. But then after that, you know, the song is over and I start praying. I don't, I don't sing that song long. Because I know where everlasting life comes from. It's from the Father. So he began the process of dying to himself right there, dying to his old life. And the second confession where he said, I've sinned and no longer worthy to be called your son. As far as Jesus is concerned, repentance involves not the admission of guilt or the acknowledgement of fault, but the confession of death, death to our old life. And this is what we talked about last week. And the lost son, you know, he wanted to fall back on bookkeeping, you know, like, oh, make me one of your hired servants. I'll just work and blah, blah, blah. No, no, no. We have to die totally to our old life. The lost son wanted to go back, but he realized he couldn't earn his way into a life. You can't earn your way into salvation. You can't earn your way into prosperous living. Amen. Uh, amen. amen. So look at this quote that we looked at last week by Robert Kappen. He says, grace does not do things tit for tat. It acts finally and fully from the start. In other words, grace in terms of his forgiveness the Lord's and, and unmerited favor towards us. It's been there all along. We just have to receive it and believe it and grab hold of it fully in our life. Because it's already there. We already have it. It's already ours. Robert Kappen also said, forgiveness surrounds us, beats upon us all our lives. We confess only to wake ourselves up to what we already have. We've already got it. The lost son woke up dead and found a brand new life in his father. It's the same for us. When we give up our old life, we find a new life hidden in Christ. Now, what does a new life entail? Now, we talk about something we didn't talk about last week. We talk about the robe. Hallelujah. See, the robe represents the robe of righteousness. The scripture talks about the robe of righteousness. And so that new life, that's the very first thing. And that's, it's not a mistake that the father in this st story turned and he mentioned first the robe. Because that's what changes. Our righteousness is his filthy rags. A right? Amen? So we put on that robe of righteousness from Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. See, we are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. That robe of righteousness comes on. That's what this new life, that's what it entails. It begins right there. Robe of righteousness. Hallelujah. And then we've got a ring. The ring is symbolic of the authority that's been given to you in the kingdom. Church, the scripture says Christ is the head and we are his body and all things are under our feet. Amen. It's either we believe that or we don't. A amen? amen? And so I, well, you know, I have a ring. You know, it's something else for me. It's a wedding ring. But see, the ring here that he's talking about is authority in his house. He wasn't getting married, right? So that's the second thing that's given to us. That robe of righteousness, when it comes on, automatically now I have authority in the kingdom. I wasn't in the kingdom before. I was out. Now I'm in. I, you know, I stepped out. I, I'm back in. Amen? Amen? Then we've got the sandals. Or the shoes. You know, Paul says the shoes of peace in Ephesians. And wherever we walk, we're supposed to have peace. Things in this life shouldn't rattle us. Things in this life shouldn't get us down, to, down and out, you know, for weeks on end. How, how many know what I'm talking about? And because when you get that robe of righteousness and you understand the authority and you begin to walk in that, now you're walking in peace. This is what the new life entails. Righteousness, authority, now I have authority, and I have peace. So, so many stop at step one. They, get, they understand, and there's a lot of people who understand, oh, I'm a child of God. I've got the righteousness and all of that. But they don't understand their authority, so they're defeated all the time. 
Amen? So if you feel like, man, why am I always losing? Why am I always defeated? Why am I always down? It's because you need to get back in the Word and pick up those Scriptures and begin to speak to that thing in the name of Jesus and put it under your feet right where it belongs. Satan's nothing but a punk. You put him right there. Amen. Amen. So the sandals represents the peace. Now, we begin and we look at the older son and his response. Verse 25. This is, this is really key. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years... I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment. And at any time, you never gave me a young goat that I can make marry with my friends. So he answered and said to his father, But as soon as the son, this son of yours came, who's devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said, and here's the father's response to the whining, uh, sorry for the, the, the sound effect. But look, that's what I think of every time I read that part. But it's key. Now look, I don't want to bust the older son's chops you know, too much. Because I, I'm going to talk to you about something with him. Verse 30. But as soon as this son of yours came to devour... And then he said to him, verse 31. Son, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. It was right we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and lost... He was lost and is found. Church, I believe God hates bookkeeping. I, I believe that with all my heart. There's no place for it in his kingdom. His ways are not our ways. His ways are higher. You know, you remember the parable with those that went out and worked in the field. They started early in the day. And they worked all day. And then there was people that came later in the day and began to work. And they finished out the day with those who had started earlier. But the man who sent them out in the field paid them all the same. What happened? Those who were there early on, they started whining. Why do they get more money than us? But see, God's math and God's bank accounts and God's kingdom is totally different than ours. The way he does finances. See, it doesn't matter. Deserve has nothing to do with it in his kingdom. Deserve has nothing to do with it. What it has to do is what you believe. Paul said that we confess and we believe with our mouth. We, we, we confess with our mouth, we believe that he rose from the dead, and then we are saved. We reap the benefits of that. So in other words, that man who's 65 and 70, 80 years old, whatever, how old he is, and he's been living like, quote, the devil all his life, and then all of a sudden he cries out to God on his deathbed and gets saved and dies 30 seconds after he says amen. Guess what? He just made it. Amen. And he gets the same reward as me. Chew on that. It doesn't matter. Now, I suggest that you don't go live like the devil all your life and wait till you get there. Because now you're just messing yourself up while you're living here. Amen. I, personally, I like having life. I like be, having prosper, prosperity. I like, you know, having peace. I like having the authority in the kingdom. I don't want any of that. I was, I was thinking we were going to get through all this. We may not. Y'all can give me another hour, right? No, I'm kidding. We won't do that. We won't do another hour. But here's the thing. The son was keeping score. The moment you start keeping track, the moment you start living legalistic is the moment you miss the train. You miss what God's grace is all about. You miss what the Father has truly done for you. The moment you give up your life, in other words, you die to yourself, your life is hidden in Him, as we said over and over. You're a son or daughter in the family, period. You don't have to worry about so-and-so. You don't have to worry about brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so or what anybody else in the family is doing. It doesn't matter. If they get something you didn't get, praise God. Hallelujah. You know what? If you get a promotion... I'm going to praise God for you. If you get a brand new house and it's bigger than mine, hallelujah. You get a Mercedes and you're sitting there with the sunroof and you just bought it brand new. Down, hallelujah. I'm going to praise God and high five with you. 
I don't care. I'm going to ride in my 2000 whatever six Tundra, I think it's 2006, with 198,000 and doesn't have the Bluetooth on the radio to hook my phone to, but I'll still praise God that yours can. Amen. We got to stop comparing. It's, not, it's time that we die to ourselves, period, end of discussion, that we're in the family, and it's time to be. See, we do from our be. We do from who we are. And when we're truly locked in, we're, uh, we're happy about our brothers and sisters and whatever else, the, the blessings that they get. We're happy about that. And when they don't have something, we don't go, well, I just thank God that I got this and they, uh, it's too bad for them. No, no, what, what, what kind of attitude is that? That's not loving your neighbor as yourself. You know, some calamity hits them and they went bankrupt and you wouldn't go, glad it wasn't me. I, I mean, we got to fix some things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, amen? So the prodigal son story is a story of grace. Jesus was telling this story to, to show the church how we're supposed to live, how we're supposed to act, how we're supposed to think, live, operate. We're not supposed to act like the older son. We're supposed to have grace in the same way the father did. He ran to him, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. I mean, that, if that's not grace, I don't know what is. That's our example of how we're supposed to treat everyone else in the kingdom. See, the older son, he was out in the field. He wasn't in the house. Why? Because the enemy will always try to get you to compare yourself, especially to those who have authority and positions. A amen. But there's no difference between you and me. We've got to stop comparing. We're both accepted in Christ. We became the same in the same house. You and I are the same Accept that. Don't look back. I don't care what you've done. You're righteous. If you've given your heart over to the Lord and you're saying, I'm a son or daughter in the kingdom, stop letting the enemy bring you down about junk you did 20 years ago. Who cares? Let that go. And all this mess, this psychiatry mess that talks about, you know, and it's old school. Most of the psychiatrists don't even believe this anymore. But, oh, some trauma happens to you. It's going to affect you the rest of your life. No. That's baloney. I serve a God that's greater than that. I serve a God that's greater than any trauma anyone experiences here on the earth. Jesus went to the cross and, 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 and had the greatest trauma on the face of the earth by going to the cross. He paid for all of it. Therefore, there's healing for those who need it. Amen. That, amen. See, the intent of sin is to remind you of your failure so, re, so you are content working in the field. Get, get this one more time. I don't think we have that one on the screen. But the intent of sin is to remind you of your failure so you are content working in the field. See, the enemy doesn't want you in the house. He wants you out of the house. He wants you miserable. Mm. Get this statement here. Man has been destroyed by the lack of understanding of God's goodness. One more time, man has been destroyed by the lack of understanding of God's goodness. Those who walk away didn't really understand. You know, those who go, oh, I tried that. I tried religion. I tried Jesus. It didn't work. You didn't really tap into the fullness of his grace. It's impossible. Everyone I know that tap, taps into the fullness of God's grace is above and not beneath. Amen. I want to go back through the story briefly, and we're going to look at just some certain points about God's goodness. I want you to see the goodness of our God. See, in verse 18, the son, the lost son said, I will arise and go to my father. See, the father never left him and made him an orphan, even though he walked away and did the wrong thing. He was still a son, and he had a father. God has never left you or forsaken you. You were a son in the house. You were a son in the pig pen. Let go of the failures because your identity with failure keeps you from your authority. Understand that that son 
he called out. He said, Father, I will go to my father. He still had a father. When he left that house, the father never disowned him. I, do you see the goodness of God? Now, see, that rankle, I mean, that just gets all the legalistic upset. That gets them all screwed up. Because they're like, oh, no, we got it. Oh, he, he was going to die and go to hell. Are you sure? A amen. You, I mean, think about it. You're going to have to think about it. But uh, you decide for yourself. But I know what I'm seeing. The younger son was given a portion. He wasn't, gi he wasn't given everything. There was still something for him when he came back. R R amen. See, the goodness of our God. See, even though you go and you mess up, or maybe you have in your past, it does not mean it's over. See, so many times we allow the enemy to, and I've heard people say, and I know you've probably heard it before as well, and this is just a damnable lie. I, I'm just, it, there's no way God could forgive me for what I did. Have you ever heard that? I, I, it's, it was so bad. You don't know what I did. I don't deserve it. You know, and they just, they do all that. It doesn't matter what it was. Think of the most awful thing. God can restore anyone. Look, the son, he went out there. He, what he wasted was in the natural, but his position in the spirit was still there. I, amen? He, said, he still had a father, and he was still a son. He said, I will go to my father. He kept calling his name. Stop allowing the enemy to tell you that your life is ruined and you wasted it all. There's somebody listening online, and you're going to be, I know it's going to not this second that we're going here in real time, but there's somebody, you're going to listen and you're going to hear this. You know, you didn't waste it all. It's not over. Don't let the enemy do that. God wouldn't let you waste it all because he knew you'd be back. Just, just don't give in to that lie. Being in the pig pen, church, is the worst. But even though he failed his daddy, he had gone through the worst of it, and he still survived. Aren't you glad you survived it? I mean, I know I am. Yes, I, I mean, look, we're still alive. We're here. If you're listening, you're still there. Notice he keeps calling him father. Just because you mess up doesn't mean you have to get saved over and over again. Let me give you the example. Just because my wife and I may have an argument and I scream and yell, maybe I did and I ran out of the house and slammed the door, that doesn't mean we need to go get remarried. You know, we can have this argument in there and she can go, just go sleep on the couch. And, you know, what? it, it doesn't matter. We're still married. I, I get this. I don't care what she, well, I do care, but you, 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 <laughs> it doesn't matter what she says. Let me put it that way, right? See, I'm, we're not God. Amen. <laughs> Those there, there's a teaching out there like you're, we're all gods. No, we're not. I, I don't have that much grace, but she's my wife. No, it doesn't matter. We can yell, scream. But I'm not getting no divorce. I don't have to go get remarried after I'm done. I'm there. If you were in the house, you're a son, a daughter in the kingdom. Mm. Let me find where I am on my notes. And here's the thing. You notice how he was talking to himself? You know, he'd be, he, it says, he, and he came to himself, and he said, and it literally said, and he said. In other words, he verbalized this out of his mouth when he was there in that situation. How many of you, you talk to yourself out loud? Y'all are weird. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. My wife just gave me that look. You know, sometimes she'll talk to herself. I'm like, what are you saying? What are you saying? Oh, nothing. I'm talking to myself. I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, sitting right here. I thought you were talking to me. I mumble. I do this thing where I just move my lips, but the words don't come out when I'm thinking, you know, and I'm talking to myself. But see, sometimes we need to open our mouths and we need to verbalize and we need to talk to ourselves. We need to talk our way out of the pig pen. We need to talk our way out of the situation that we're in. Begin to speak to it in Jesus' name. You can talk your way back. 
And look, you may not be able to talk it right in the beginning because, see, the son wasn't all there in that first confession, remember? But see, later on, when he realized, he, can't, he said, I'm not worthy. I, he just got it right there. He got it. Begin to start talking to yourself. You'll get it. You'll get it. Let me give you an example. It's in unforgiveness. You know that person that you can't stand, that you hate their guts, even every time they open their mouth? It, actually, you just see their face, and you're just like, oh, my gosh. Okay, you're just so upset, and you're mad. You're in unforgiveness. For the, but the Spirit begins to convict you, and you're like, oh, I need to forgive that person. You don't feel like it. You don't really want to. You know that they don't deserve it, but you've got to talk your way to it. You've got to start by just saying, I forgive so-and-so. Out of your mouth, I forgive Dan, whatever, whatever his name, it doesn't matter, him or her. You say the name and you say it out loud. That's your first step, talking yourself back. And you begin to do it and eventually you'll get it. And all of a sudden, the feelings, the negative feelings that you had towards that person actually changed. It actually changes. Their life and death are in the power of the tongue. That's what Proverbs says. We've got to talk our way back. Amen. And he knew the way back. He knew the way to freedom. He knew his way back to the Father's house. He knew his way back to healing. Talk your way back to prosperity. So many times we just accept things and just say, oh, that's just the way it is. No, it doesn't have to be that way. Amen. Allow God, begin to speak to that situation and allow God to give you the wisdom to get out of it Amen. and to begin to make right choices. Don't be that person, though, that just sits there and just, well, in the name of Jesus, I got a job. I need a job. I ain't got one in Jesus' name. Lord, I think I'll just claim a job right now. Hallelujah. And then you go sit and you turn the TV on. <laughs> faith without, faith without is, amen. You got it. See, the father, he didn't move. He was always there. And what was he doing? He was looking for the son. He was looking. The younger son was on the father's mind more than the father was on his own mind. When the enemy tries to tell you you've blown it, remember that God, even for one second, hasn't forgotten about you. God, even for one second, hasn't stopped loving you. We've got to stop trying to control people with fear. We've got to trop, stop saying that they're on their way to an eternity in hell. We need to start saying they're on their way back. We need to confess something different. We need to say so-and-so, they're on their way back into the kingdom. They're saved in Jesus' name. They're a son in the kingdom. and They're a daughter in the kingdom right now in Jesus' name. We need to begin to speak life. We need to begin to speak that. And we need to speak what's true. Jesus loves them. God loves them. God loves them with an everlasting love. God paid the price for them in Jesus' name. You know, we need to confess that so that they will come back to the kingdom. There's power in prayer. There's power in your words. In verse 18, he knew that his father was going to listen and accept him. God's not mad at you. He's not whispering, I told you so. He says, son, I knew when I gave you eternal life, you were going to think, oh, I'll just live the way I want to. And you found yourself in a mess. He knew what you were going to do. You know, how many have kids? When they're young, after you tell them to do something, what's the first thing they're going to do? Most of the time they do the opposite, right? The preaching of the law brings, can, breeds contempt in the believer. Start preaching love to those around you. I'm preaching grace because once you understand how truly God is, you won't want to go to the pig pen anymore. These individuals, they've heard it. They know it. They get it. They're just doing like what a little child would do at the moment. They're a little immature. They need to come back. And we need to be able to pray for them and say, come back. Come back to the kingdom. In verse 21 and 22, I want to read that. If we can go ahead and put that up on the screen. 
because this is also key, because even though the son got it and he knew that he wasn't worthy, I, I want you to see this. Verse 21. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants. Now, we can stop right there. The father didn't even say anything to him. He didn't even acknowledge it. He just immediately turned to the servants. Mm. Get this. Because if you want God to ignore you, talk about your failure. He doesn't want to hear it. Our, our <laughs> See, the father understood he got it, but he's not going to acknowledge that because it's over. It's already over. If you want God to ignore you, just start talking to him about your failure. Talk about how bad you've been. Oh, God, I'm so unworthy. No, he already knows. It's over. We need to come to the place where we realize we're not worthy, but we can't stay there. Yet we come to that spot, and the moment we come to that spot, now it's time for change. It's now time to be that new creation that Jesus made. It's not time to sit there and keep wallowing. Oh, I'm not worthy. I'm just not... I can't, I just can't stand it. I'm just, I'm just not worthy. And then you just can't do anything for God. You can't do nothing for God in that state, and you surely can't do anything for yourself. Amen. Amen. See, I, God, it's like he's sitting there, I don't want to hear it because you're boasting your failure above my grace. That's what I, I, that's what I believe God's saying. The truth is the son treated like the son was treated like the failure never happened. I mean, the father just literally just turned. It's like it didn't even happen at all. It was all over. Mm. The son, I'm going to give you a couple more and we're almost done. The son was never punished by his father for leaving. Get this. The father never punished the son for leaving. He did it to himself. Have you ever had someone, they did something, you know, your kids or whatever, or somebody else, they did something so bad, and, you know, the kid's expecting punishment, but you go, you got punishment enough with what you went through just now. And you didn't punish them? I know I've done that with my kids. It was so bad enough, that, I mean, they're bawling, they're crying, you know, this bad thing happened, you know, they did this. I'm just like, well, you, you got it. You don't need that. You don't need the punishment. What you need right now is healing. You need love. You need reconciliation. See, that's what God, the son was never punished by his father for leaving. God's not going to get you when you least expect it. He's not there looking with a lightning bolt finger. You know, that's not him. God is love. The father never punished the son. The only punishment the son went through was he refused to obey the father and opened himself up to the enemy. It's the enemy that destroys, not God. God's not an angry God. God's not looking to pay you back. If he is, then Jesus was not the Messiah. In verse 24, there was no response from the father in the negative, even while the younger son wasn't acting like the son. He still celebrated him coming back. Church, you, I mean, we have to get this. You know, you come back. At that moment, you're transformed. The robe of righteousness goes on. You're a good person at that moment. Are, are you here? Get this. It's not God keeping it from you. It, and deserve has nothing to do with it. I want you also to know in verse 32, when we see the very last verse of this parable, this is the last point, it's never recorded that the younger son left the presence again. Do you see how understanding the goodness of God makes you want to live right? I will never leave the goodness of God. I just won't do it. So when, when you really get it, you're not leaving. You're not leaving because you understand. Mm. If you're only going home to get beat, I think I wouldn't come home. Church, think about that. If he was sitting there, if he knew that his father was going to be so mad and beat him or whatever or punish him, would he have gone back? No. He knew he had a loving father. He knew deep down. 
All those people who talk about, oh, God's punished and me, God's angry. Baloney. You know that ain't true. That's nothing but baloney. Church, God is not going to get you. We shouldn't come to God in fear. The punishment was paid by him on the cross. And the punishment was paid, paid to this son when he was in the pig pen. Sin's the punishment. Sin is the punishment. A- Amen. 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 The enemy wants to make us think we've blown it, that we're second class. When my kids come to me for money, do you think I empty the checking and the savings account? No, I only give them a portion because I know they're going to blow it on temporary fun. That's what the father did. He still had that robe ready for him. Amen. God is good. You've got more waiting on you in your future than you've ever wasted in your past. Let's all stand. Here's what God's saying to us right now. In verse 31, the father said to the older son, All that I have is yours. All that I have is yours. That's what he said to the older son. And it was like, didn't you know? That was kind of like the attitude. Didn't you know? All that I have is yours. That's what the Father is saying to us right now. All that he has is yours. All the promises in the word, they're yours. Now we've got to die to bookkeeping. We've got to die to ourselves and walk in the Spirit. We walk in the Spirit. And we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit after next week. Because I think it's so important because, see, remember, at the beginning of the year, the word for this year was to seek, worship, and obey. You can't do that last part without the Spirit. You'll get into bookkeeping. Your obedience will be bookkeeping. It will be, I've got to earn it. But God says, book kingdom, bookkeeping's not in my kingdom. My grace is sufficient. Just as Pastor Carrie Ann said earlier, my grace is sufficient for you. It's all you need. All you need is God's grace. All you need, He has it all. And so what I want us to do is pray a prayer of faith. A prayer of faith believing that God, I receive all that you have for me. The promises in your word They're mine. The promises of prosperity, the promises of healing, the promises, whatever the promises are, whatever it is that you're in need of, they're there in the word that you know. They're yours. All that he has is yours. And there is no end to the riches of God. It's everlasting. He can keep on pouring out and keep on blessing over and over. And why does he do it? Because he wants to bless his kids. He wants to celebrate. He wants to partay. (laughs) Just like in the prodigal son. What was it? It was a party at the end, right? So let's understand that that's what God wants to do with each of us. And let's believe for that right now. Father, right now. This morning, we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I thank you for what you've done, how you sent your son on the cross to die. You paid it all so that we could have all. All that you have is ours, and we believe that now. We receive the fullness of your grace. We receive the promises that are in your word. And that promise right now, the thing that's coming to your mind that you need, I want you to call that out to the Lord right now. Just begin to call it out to him in Jesus' name. That promise is mine. That promise is mine in Jesus' name. He would supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. That's what the scripture says. So Lord, you said you'd supply that need. That promise, all that you have, all that he has is yours. Just, Just claim that right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you that it is ours. Lord, that we have life and that all things are under our feet. You are the head. We are your body. All things. You've given us the authority. 
And now, Lord, as we leave from here, we are walking in nothing but peace. We have those shoes of peace on. We've got our robe of righteousness, our ring and our shoes. And Lord, we say that we are prosperous in you, that our life is hidden in you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Can we give the Lord a hand and just seal that right now? Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we praise you, Lord. You are worthy.